Welcome back to the Remedial Film Class Podcast. I'm your host, Dan. And I'm Travis. I'm George. And I'm Troy Howarth. Hey, Troy. Welcome Yay. back, sir. Yay. Friend of the show. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Friend of the show, commentator extraordinaire, author of all uh, fantastic, mostly horror. Is it all horror still, if we count the Kinski as horror? Uh, well, it's it's a mix, let's say. It's uh, primarily horror, probably, but there's there's other goodies there, too. Cinema extraordinaire. Uh, joining us tonight for a non-Italian, non-horror movie. So, uh, thank you, Troy, for joining us for uh, our discussion of Stanley Kubrick's The Killing from 1956. Nice. Always happy to talk about Kubrick. Now, George... Troy, I'm going to call you the Blu-ray icon. How's that? Ah! <laughs> I've been called worse. <laughs> I don't know. That's over Comment- my head. I don't know. He's commentary. <laughs> I don't know. Oh. Now, George, I've made you watch a black and white movie. Uh, I'm sorry that the colors weren't modern. Uh, I hope you made it through okay. It's not the first. And it won't be the oh, last. Uh, believe be you, I'm me, cool. you. So uh, I just wanted to start off tonight and see, George, how are you doing, man? Uh, having come out of uh, Kubrick, but without any color. Um, pretty good. Pretty good. It was, uh, you know, not, uh, not a modern movie, <clears throat> kind of what I expected. Um, as far as, you know, everything about it, the acting and the, and the, the shots and all that stuff. And Travis, and, uh, uh, was the this story your... was good. Story was good. Plot was good. Mm-hmm. Uh, yes, this is my first viewing of this movie. And so uh, give me your quick first impression, Travis. <clears throat> <laughs> do you want my last night's impression or today's impression the other day i really thought you liked it but i think you were talking about our next movie uh yeah, I when i go cool. back and reread our text chat i was like <laughs> wow travis loves this movie i'm doing good and oh he means next week's movie's good he hates this one damn it <laughs> i did not hate it i did not hate it there it, there were things about it that uh i i didn't like the narration which was throwing me off because it i wasn't I don't know. It's it's the movie wasn't Kubrick enough for me because I'm working backwards. So I'm see now I'm seeing his early work knowing the masterpieces that he's going to make. So I was watching it and I was like, mm, and I knew why we were watching it, so I was trying to look at why we were watching I it. I don't I don't know why we were watching this. I know now. I after have like finishing a, it. I have like a very small like <clears throat> maybe idea of why we're watching it. <clears throat> Excuse me. But uh I guys, I I thought it was good, man. Now, Troy, yeah. a little bit of background for what we're doing right now on the show. Uh we've been watching the Nolan Batman trilogy. Uh mm-hmm. and then in between, we've been exploring the influences of uh Nolan, the influences upon Nolan's work and why his Batman movies are more than just like comic book movies, but they are like cinema. And why they exist within this greater context of cinema, hence the killing. Uh, now, what's your background with Nolan Batman movies and with this movie? Well, my background uh, with Nolan Batman movies, I mean, I've seen them. Um, I suppose I I probably like them more then than I do now. Uh, the first one, I remember thinking... This feels like two thirds of a really good Christopher Nolan movie with one third of a, of a dumb, overblown action movie. It doesn't feel like him. That's fair. Uh, That's I, fair. I thought, you know, if this film does well, maybe the next one will be more pure Nolan, which it was. Um, Dark Knight is one of those films that came out and, you know, it was kind of acclaimed and, you know, everybody was in sort of rapture over it, what an extraordinary film it was and blah, blah, blah. And, I like it, but it's one of those movies that I think hits everything a little too square on the head. It, it's kind of a movie where people don't really talk. They pontificate. <laughs> they kind of make big, heavy points a lot of the time in a way that doesn't feel very uh, naturalistic to me. Um, the third one, which everybody seems to dislike, I actually kind of like because I thought at least it had more of a sense of humor because to my mind, and bear in mind, I'm not really a comic book buff. That's not really my thing. That's not what I grew up with. 
and uh, comic book movies in general really aren't my thing, uh, although I, I do think some of them are more interesting than others. But I did think that, you know, in, in an attempt to make them more kind of realistic and attempt to make them seem a little bit more gritty, they kind of lost a sense of fun. So I appreciated the third one that there was a little bit more sort of tongue in cheek humor and it was a little bit more just sort of fun and enjoyable and entertaining. I mean, I, ultimately they aren't huge favorites of mine. Uh, when I think of Christopher, Christopher Nolan, the two films of his that I really like are Insomnia with Al Pacino and uh, The Prestige with uh, Christian Bale. Um, those are the ones that I kind of gravitate towards. So that probably tells you a lot about what I'm like and what I <laughs> kind of get out of those films. Prestige may be my favorite Nolan flick, if you don't count the Batmans, because I have a Batman bias. But of his non-Batman stuff, Prestige is just, oh my God, dark. I, I loved Insomnia. I think we're going to probably watch that. It's, yeah, I think it, Insomnia was really terrific. And it was yeah. for... Until The Irishman came out um, in, I guess it was 2019 at this point, it was the last great film performance that Pacino gave uh, for a long time. Mm -hmm. I mean, I always enjoy him, but he did kind of fall into a rut of doing, frankly, rather crappy movies and usually just kind of hamming his way through them. Um, but he's really, really terrific in Insomnia, and so is Rob Williams. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. But it's a rock solid film all around. I just revisited within the last year or so, and it, I think it still holds up. I think because it was a remake, um, that was kind of a strike against it for a lot of people. And so it tends to get, I think, a little bit underrated. But I I love that film very much. I think it's a really terrific film. And what's your relationship yep. like with The Killing? Because I know I'd seen you post about it recently, and I was like, oh, that's awesome. We're, just, we're doing that movie. But Yeah, um, I mean, I'm a Kubrick fan. I've, I've kind of, it's interesting, down through the years, I've kind of, gone back and forth on him there was a period of time where i was very in love with his movies and there was a period of time where i was not so crazy about him because i kind of fell into that thing of thinking oh they're kind of you know too too cold and clinical and you know it's not really my thing but now i've i've fallen you know i think i'm going to remain <laughs> a, a tremendous pubic fan um this has always been one of the ones i've really liked though i mean it's interesting um, talking about you know what he became versus where he started off and yeah that's true this is a smaller film this is a b movie um, uh, this is a movie that was made on a, a lower budget um, he had to make this in 24 days which is a tremendous difference from 300 days that he used on what? ice White. um so it is a smaller more compact film but i've always liked that i'm a big film noir fan too so this ticks all the boxes for me. I, I, I still think this is one of his best films, actually. 24 days? Yeah. What? 24 days. Yeah, and it budgeted at about 200 Halloween. grand. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Didn't well, he... yeah, bear, bearing in mind, it's 20, 22 years before uh, that. Yeah, so much bigger. 200, cast. Grand, 200 grand stretched a little bit further, but still 24 days. That's very, very quick, especially he... for Cuba. Yeah. Didn't he spend like three and a half years on The Shining? Oh, he like, spent a, I mean, the, the longest, the longest shoot, the longest continuous film shoot in history in the Guinness Book of World Records is apparently Eyes Wide Shut. Okay. Um, but in terms of The Shining took a very long time to make, you know, when you get into something like 2001, it gets complicated because yes, they, they shot all that material with the actors, I think in 1965, but then he spent three years working on special effects shots. Um, so that's uh, okay. not, it's not really, that's not like it's, Continuous shooting, yeah. Not, well, not exactly. He had to fake the moon landing in that time. <laughs> yeah, that's, right? yeah so, that's true. So he was kind of busy. <laughs> he was busy. You know. And I think The Shining, busy. it took three years to edit that movie. Okay. It yeah. took a very long time to do everything with it. <laughs> he kept getting distracted at that one scene and yeah. <laughs> took him yeah. out of the editing process a little bit. He's like, I'm fine once she turns old. <laughs> no, <I'm kidding. laughs> Jeez Louise. Uh... I got a few vibes from this movie. Like when I was complaining in my head about it, it had a, like an Ocean's Eleven kind of feel. Yeah. But nowhere near as complex. So it seemed mm -hmm. kind of eh. Can I can I ask a question? Um, it was the going back in time and watching each character kind of like in a sequence. Is that something that was done regularly back then? No. Okay. No. Okay, so and that inspired a lot of people. So I noticed that, right? <laughs> yeah. That's that that's something where I was like, okay, that's like a yeah. um 
Uh, that was who's, that, who's the that director was very... that I'm thinking of? Tarantino. Yes, it Tarantino. reminded me of Tarantino, which I know Tarantino loves Kubrick. So <clears throat> yeah, yeah, whatever. Well, that was very controversial at the time because they had a uh, they had a preview screening for the film, and uh, people didn't like that back and forth. It was very unusual for 1956. So mm-hmm. they actually were pressured into putting it into chronological order, which they did, and it didn't work at all. So they mm-hmm. they switched it back. So mm. the uh, the jumping around like that, the nonlinear structure, very very big influence on Tarantino, especially uh, uh, you know obviously Pulp Fiction and Reservoir Dogs. I think in particular, you can see the DNA of this movie all over. It. Yes, Reservoir yeah. Dogs was the one I was yeah. thinking of mostly. Yeah, yeah. there were a That's couple of scenes thing. where That's I thought that thing. yeah. I kept thinking with a couple of scenes, we could use some De Palma split screen to really like <laughs> show us some simultaneous activity that would really build the tension. But in 1956, I think it's just an example of them like finding the vocabulary to translate to the audience the idea of a kind of out of sync movie. Right. Yeah. It reminded me kind of, of uh, if you ever watch Frenzy uh, from Hitchcock, which I think I've brought up on the show before, yes. uh, you know, it's, uh, master filmmaker, yes, but he lacks like the visual vocabulary to really do the things he's trying to do <laughs> in the movie, you know? Uh, and it's here, it's because, you know, it's new and it's a new thing that Kubrick's going to learn in time. And Hitchcock just never had the, you know, the decades to mm. get the the sexual violence right. So it just came off awkward and kind of weird. Well, I don't know that I'd agree with that. Oh, really? Uh-oh. Are we going to fight about lovelies? <laughs> now, I'm a Hitchcock fan, so I'll stand up for him. See, and I, I, I love Hitchcock, but I feel like that movie, he's trying to be like Wes Craven, and he just doesn't have the, you know, he he's too old to be as gross as Wes Craven was in Last House, and so it's like, well, we'll do Last House, but like we'll do it classy, and it just ends up awkward. <laughs> It's one way of looking at it. <laughs> Speaking of classy and awkward, Rodney Dangerfield's in this movie. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's a really? heck of a cast, yeah. man. The crowd singing, that's right. He, yeah, he plays very, a... Very yeah, he's in the track the track uh, where George the Animal Steel basically is, is beating up Maurice. <laughs> uh, he... Dangerfield apparently is a extra, and he's like in the background and the foreground and like featured extra in a few of the scenes. No word. If you look it up online, you can see there's people have done frame grabs uh, where you can see him. Um, Yeah, it was that was well, that was well before most anybody knew who he was. Which makes the jockey uh, line in Caddyshack a lot funnier. There you go. (laughs) What's the jockey line in Caddyshack? When he's looking at the stake, he's like, look at the stake. You can still see the marks where the jockey was hitting it. Now, it, that is funny. Had I seen that movie, I didn't know what you were talking about. You saw about. Caddyshack? Did you no. know? What? I've seen right. bits and pieces of Caddyshack. Put it on the Stop list. Recording and just watch Caddyshack. This, I mean, this is why we're doing this, right? Because <laughs> I haven't true. seen anything. We haven't watched that yet because I thought you already saw it. <laughs> no, I mean, I know about it, but I, okay. and I've seen a scene here or there. But yeah. We'll not... go to that. We'll do that. Yep. All right, cool. Now, it is early Kubrick. Uh, there is a narrator, which I you know is as much for the audience as it is for... You know, like the audience of the time to kind of handhold them. Necessary. I think it kind of took away ah, from the. the how story are you going to do it different and tell an know, audience yeah. in 1956 what's going on, right? <sighs> jumping. I think as much jumping around as they did, they yeah. kind of needed it. The characters. Bear in were mind, not, not only is it 1956, but it's also kind of a common film noir trope, and I don't yes, know how. Yes, it is. I don't mm-hmm. know how familiar everybody is with film noir, um, but it's it's a uh, it's a very particular style of film that's really kind of most prevalent in the 40s and 50s. I mean, most people would agree that noir, the true noir period is kind of going from, say, um, Maltese Falcon in 1941 through Touch of Evil at Mm. the end of the 50s. Um, And a lot of those films did use things like uh, narration, very often a kind of a doom-laden narration where you get the sense that something's going on that's probably not going to end very well. So it was kind of a conventional thing mm-hmm. for the time, too. My first film noir uh, example of the narration would be um, Dead Men Don't Wear Plaid. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> Which was a Steve Martin movie. So, mm-hmm. 
it kind of and then who framed roger rabbit kind of had that feel too so i kind of got taken to that and then obviously sin city and all those movies that come out but i i kind of went backwards i was introduced to it through comedy because mm-hmm. they do that a lot the narration and the, you know well and if george oh, yeah. had out, out if george had jumped on reading batman year one <clears throat> uh since the three three weeks three weeks ago when we said hey you ought to read this uh, it's got some right. serious noir narration vibes. All that Frank right. Miller stuff does. Lots of grim, dark, White tough boxes. talking in the boxes. Yeah. In the boxes. <laughs> Gotta not love the boxes. In, not in the man. bubbles. In boxes. <laughs> <laughs> now, one thing I noticed, uh, Troy, are you, I, I assume you're a, a fan of Rafifi. Uh, I think oh, most of us film yes. nerds are. Uh, is this movie capitalizing on Rafifi or is it coincidence? Because it's like a Ooh. year apart. Monkey from Lion King. <laughs> Rafifi? <laughs> the monkey's his uncle. Yeah, no, I know what he's talking about. <laughs> 1953 French noir uh, by an American director, Jules Dessin, who was one of the uh, the victims of the House on American Activities, Red Scare back in the back in the 40s and 50s, you know, the, the commie scare, which actually that also affected Sterling Hayden, who plays the lead in this film as well. Uh, Rafiki was one of, well, probably the great kind of setting the stage for a, a sort of heist movie, caper movie. Um, I don't know that they were necessarily thinking of that one specifically. I mean, bear in mind, Kubrick is only at this time 27 years old. Um, he's only made two other films prior to this. There's a movie called Fear and Desire and another even cheaper, much cheaper noir film called Killer's Kiss. Um, and I think at this point, he's just trying to find good commercial material that's going to help him to kind of make his mark and, and get started. So I'm sure he was aware of Rafifi. I'm sure that uh, at, at least on some subconscious level, he was thinking of that and was influenced by it. But I don't recall ever reading any specific quotes from him saying that that was what made him want to make this particular story. Fair. Fair. What do you think, Dan? You think he had only seen it later? After <sighs> you know, guys. Carp- carpenter answer. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna go there. I'm not influenced by it. I, I don't saw it later on. <laughs> Is Troy aware of that? I doubt that Troy's aware of my campaign. <laughs> but he does have a book on. I, um, so I think he would enjoy it, though. Troy, a little preview of your book coming out about Umberto Lindsay, uh, one of my favorite Italian maestros. Uh, question for you as the author of this book about Lindsay where do you fall uh, when you look at the works of like Halloween especially compared to some visual um, some some visuals in especially the first reel of Seven Bloodstained Orchids are, are oh, you well, what do you think about the controversy right <laughs> I don't know that, uh, I know that Carpenter was a fan, is a fan, a big fan of, of Dario Argento, um, and certainly had seen movies like Bird with the Crystal Plumage and Four Flies on Grey Velvet by the time he made Halloween. Uh, he's also familiar with Baba's work. He may well have seen some of the other movies. I mean, Lindsay's stuff really didn't get that kind of play in the U.S. Um, he may have seen it, but I think sometimes it just is kind of a good old fashioned coincidence. I think sometimes we look for homage and ripoff where sometimes it is just kind of coincidental. I think one of the big um, connections really was uh, Bob Clark's movie, Black Christmas, which um, Carpenter definitely was aware of. And there is a story behind that as far as, you know, having talked with Bob Clark about making a sequel to Black Christmas, which never happened. I, I don't know. I don't believe that uh, it's necessarily was ever anything overtly like stolen or anything like that. No, but I think he was trying to kind of do something in a similar vibe to a lot of those Italian films. Inspired we, by. We should say. we should probably talk off air, just you and I. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but anyway. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> he's not convinced, guys. I got more work to do. Hey, uh, no. <laughs> so back to the killing. You you know, it's early Kubrick. You can tell that he is, you know, still kind of up and coming. There's not a lot of, <clears throat> I wouldn't say there's a lot of new ground broken visually with the movie. Most of it is pretty traditionally framed. But every now and then you get some really like dynamic camera swoop or like at one point 
the framing like backs up just enough to like add a character to the frame. You know, you get like a moving camera backwards down the hall from the shining in its early proto form. Are you catching this George that while you're watching this movie, like, Oh man, he's doing some of his, his best tricks just in like a prototypical form. Uh, no, I, I didn't catch the camera tricks hmm. as much. <laughs> when we're done with you, you're going to catch like <laughs> the, the Spielberg dolly zoom. I yeah. catch that in cartoons. I'm like, oh, <laughs> there's the Spielberg dolly zoom. <laughs> uh, don't forget Hitchcock did that first. Yes, yes. But it's like, or the what's the name of that scream that, that they use at ILM? All the, the Wilhelm the, scream. Wilhelm scream. And it's like, you hear that, you'll hear that in, in like Skittles commercials. And you're like, oh my God, <laughs> there's a scream. So yeah, it'll, it'll, it'll grow on. The uh, other day, my good. six-year-old boy was watching something. And he goes, "Oh, Dad, it was the scream." <laughs> I'm like, mm-hmm. "I yep. we might hang out too much if a six year old is yep. catching that." Yeah, it's in Toy Story when you hear it in every Pixar movie. Yeah, yeah, it's what you're paying for, George, in this curricula, right? Like, <laughs> right. No, you didn't see the Win- Wendy theory in the Killing. It's, oh, it's like no. the very early stages. Ugh. <laughs> 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 uh. I had a buddy who was uh, this week who was like, hey, I was listening to your Shining episode. And I was like, oh, how about that Wendy theory? He's like, mm. <laughs> He hasn't watched the video either. It's no, fine. the Wendy theory is it, it's legit. It is, it is definitely. It's fine. Well, Troy, we'll talk off, offline. At, at, <laughs> at the very least, Kubrick made that movie to have satisfied multiple people and theories on purpose. <sighs> On purpose. He did it on purpose, on I swear. Purpose. Okay. That's how I feel. We'll get All you right. eventually. We'll get you there. Yikes. Hey, uh, George, you always <laughs> fail at this, but I'm going to ask you anyway. Um, yeah. Did you happen to recognize the main actor in this movie? No. <laughs> <laughs> he recognized him when he had the clown mask on. I did. <laughs> did you recognize him with the clown mask on? Were you like, hey, that's, did. that's definitely Dix Handley is who that is. <laughs> no. That was Sterling no. Hayden. He was in Godfather. He's the uh, corrupt police. Is he a lieutenant or, officer, yeah. or chief or something? He's chief, He gets blown he away at the dinner. Try the veal. Try the Wait. veal. Yeah, remember when he drops the gun a little too slow and walks out? The two guys he kills. Yes. He's the cop. He's the Irish cop. Oh my god! Yeah. He was also in. Uh, okay, how many years apart are these two movies, though? I don't think that's such. Years. That's thirty years. That's not such that's a bad no. not twenty twenty years. That's not such a bad non recognition, especially with for someone with my track record. That's right. fair, except that you also saw him in <laughs> Doctor Strangelove. Strangelove yeah. as the Air Force. Uh, what's his name? General. What's his name? Or Ripper. Oh yeah, Jack D. Ripper. <laughs> I tried to forget that entire movie. What so. are you talking about? That was no, a good I'm movie. Just I'm just oh, kidding. That's a joke. Oh, That's come on now. Kidding. And at some point, um, I'm going to make you watch Concrete make Jungle. <laughs> and when you watch Concrete Jungle, you're going to be like, oh my God, his name is really Dix Handley. And that's why Dan keeps bringing it up every time we watch him in a movie. Hi, this is Dan in Post. Uh, Asphalt Jungle, not Concrete Jungle. Okay, back to the show. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <sighs> He was also the killer in Scream. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> he, was, he was the voice of Ghostface. He, he was actually the first Italian stallion, which was very confusing. Yeah. <laughs> he was Spider Rico. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Holy mackerel. We, he's in every movie we watch, George. Pay attention. So the one of the reasons we wanted you to watch this, George, besides the fact that it influences The Dark Knight, it has a very early heist movie structure. You know, it's after Rafifi, which you you haven't seen, uh, which is like the godfather of all heist movies. This is right around that time and and a slightly different execution. It's got the timeline jumping, which necessitates a narrator, although uh, I like a narrator. The Town That Dreaded Sundown's narrator may be my favorite thing about that movie besides the trombone. (laughs) Is this where I do the trombone noise? No. (laughs) No, not doing that. So, George, That's a really messed up scene. 
It's a great movie. I'm sorry. It's great so movie. Bad. It's on sale right now. I saw one of the websites selling it's it for like 15 bucks. Everybody needs to buy one. Wow. It's a good movie. George, why did we make you watch this when we're about to talk about The Dark Knight? Um, obviously because the clown mask is the Joker. Yes. Whoa. That is pretty much the mask that the Joker wears, and that's on purpose. Yeah, it, the, yeah. First but it's scene. not the only reason. <clears throat> no, not the only reason. But like I'm when assuming. I saw that mask, I was like, "Oh my god!" Yeah. But the whole, even even everybody getting wiped out, like it's yeah, it's it's all there. Yeah. It just took me a while to recognize it. Like mm-hmm. I'm I'm watching this movie. I'm like, okay, where are the influences? Totally not realizing the other things that I was learning, like the Tarantino stuff and, and yeah. But then once they got into the once I noticed that the wife was cheating and then she was plotting behind the back of the husband mm-hmm. and then I'm like, okay, this is gonna go wrong. And then I started realizing, okay, they're gonna and then when he put that mask on, I'm like, oh okay. But then I also realized these guys are getting wiped out. No one's gonna survive this thing except for the bus driver. <laughs> right. Right. What bus driver? What bus driver. <laughs> um no, yeah, it's it's almost like this is an hour and a half version of the first three minutes of The Dark Knight. Yeah, so I get picked up right at that point. Boom. Yeah. And it's actually, almost like if I was doing like a pitch for this movie, I'd be like, so you saw The Dark Knight, right? You know the first three minutes? That's if you like that three minutes, <laughs> watch this movie. Now, there's a little bit more than just the first three minutes, but I, I mean, yeah. yeah, for the most part, The Dark Knight is doing like the Simpsons parody version of this movie with its yes. opening, uh, yes, with that big absolutely. IMAX sequence, which if you'll remember mm-hmm. back in the marketing, they were showing that sequence in IMAX uh, as like a preview yeah, in IMAX theaters. And so instead of a trailer, you could go and watch up through the reveal uh, of him under the mask as like a you know way to get people all hyped up for the dark knight which it's weird now really like <laughs> 14 years later to be like oh yeah one at one time we had to convince people to go watch the best superhero movie ever mm-hmm. but yeah. we did and that's how they did it by showing them the killing starring the joker nice but note too i mean it, it doesn't just Stranger. stop there the joker's main weapon uh the shotgun Right, mm-hmm. same weapon as Handley, yeah. or I guess in what is his name in this one, Sterling, the main guy. Johnny Clay. So, he's got his shotgun, uh, he's got the mask, and he's got the mm-hmm. giant bag, right? Like that. Yeah. In mm-hmm. the Dark Knight, it's duffel bags, but I mean, it's the same kind of, you know, it looks like you're throwing a body in a bag because of all. It's huge. It's yeah. it's amazing. It's huge. It's big, heavy. But there's one other thing that I want you to remember in the spoilers if you haven't seen The Dark Knight, listeners. Think about what Joker does with the loot that he steals. Yeah. He torches it. And in this one, it wasn't his intent, but... He torches half of it. Yeah. But I mean, (laughs) you know, his half, his cut, he torches. And in this one, you watch it just evaporate on the runway. Yeah. Pretty baller stuff, man. Although, you feel bad for the guy. It's not about money. It's <laughs> about sending a message. Yo, dude, I have never <laughs> wanted to kill a dog <laughs> before in my life until I watched this movie. You didn't like the dog? No. The dog is the hero of the movie. I think we Actually, can all agree. Lady too. Actually, no, the dog doesn't know any better. Scratch that. I like the dog. The cargo driver. The lady. Uh, yeah, okay. The lady. the lady, man. Oh, man. I mean, if you're blaming anyone for the outcome of this movie, it's got to be the guy that picked that suitcase. Yeah, and it had to be a friggin' monsoon coming through that it caused a, a whirlwind like that. I've never seen anything. <laughs> oh, yeah, I don't know. It was like an F2. Yeah, jet engines <laughs> kind of, you know, back and forth everywhere. Maybe an F2. It gets a little windy there. Just waiting for Annie M to fly by. Oh, dude, there's all kinds of stuff about this movie. Weird stuff that I kind of caught like there was a, there was a door that they walked through. Oh, it was the chess and checkers place. Mm. He walks through the door and it says chess and checkers on the inside. It should say chess and checkers on the outside. Facing outward. All those letters, all those letters should be backwards and they weren't. I was like, that was kind of like a little bit of an oversight. 15 cents an hour, man. 
And although if you read the sign, it's only 15 cents an hour till like 1 p.m. And then they start jerking the price up on you. Yeah. Right. Typical but chess also, guys. But also that was turned around for a reason because Wendy theory. Wendy theory. Yeah. Uh, my other issue <laughs> is the Maurice character. I'm not really sure what. Which one's Maurice? He was the George the Animal Steel, um, you know, bald guy with hair everywhere but his head. Yeah. Um, the bar fight guy. The bar fight guy. His accent, I wasn't really sure why it was necessary to have that accent because I couldn't really understand it. The accent was what you had a problem with? How about the entire fight scene? Well, I don't... It was hilarious That's to fine. watch. <laughs> but well, I just want, I wanted to understand what he was saying. He yeah. probably had the accent because that was how he talked <laughs> in real life. <laughs> it, was, it was probably like watching... Uh, Schwarzenegger in Hercules goes to New York, but without the voiceover. <laughs> like it was just like the guys on the set must have been like, we gotta get this guy a dub. Wouldn't it be we funny? Can't understand him. <laughs> That's so funny. It's like, oh man, I couldn't couldn't uh, do the accent. It's like his, his fake <laughs> accent was horrible. It's like, oh, that's a real accent, dude. No, I, it sounded like a good accent. It probably was his you real just accent. Couldn't really but I couldn't understand as much. I had to put on the subtitles just to know what ah. the hell he was saying. And you know how I love subtitles. Yeah, I know you love subtitles. <laughs> I turned on the subtitles at one point, and Troy, maybe you know this answer and I don't have to keep scouring the internet, but at one point toward the end of the movie, uh, as the George character is uh, coming back to his apartment, the parrot sounds like it drops an F-bomb. It sounds like he's insulting one of the characters, and of course it's probably just some, you know, it's not the trained parrot, it's somebody doing a dub, but... Do you know what I'm talking about, guys? Where the the parrot sounds like he's telling either the George or the girl to like f off. Does anybody I know what I'm talking about? It's not I subtitled. Didn't I didn't hear it at the time. I thought he said, but... "I'm malting." <laughs> <laughs> I didn't hear it at the time, but um, a lot of the uh, parrot overdub was. <laughs> Questionable. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't get the right voiceover guy. <laughs> there was, no, ah, just, black. Just, yeah. yeah. Just this, like the stuff that the bird was saying was like not stuff a bird would say. Right. Like fuck you know? <laughs> <laughs> No. Actually, a bird would, would say, say that, that dude. Yeah. If your bird is annoying, well, yeah, and you tell it to fuck off every day, it's <laughs> gonna off. start saying fuck, fuck off, off, fuck off, fuck off, fuck off. <laughs> like it's gonna do that. I hear you. If you, you know. If you go fuck off. If that's what you say. But the things we would say, it was like, it wasn't there at one point it was like, I'll oh, be careful. It's like, what? I swore to my sister that what? we would stop swearing. <laughs> <laughs> well, you shouldn't have sworn then. Oh, parrot swears are fun, though. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah. Questionable parrot dialogue. I'll have to look that up. Hey, this is Dan and Post. Uh, stick around to the end of the show because we actually do get a little deeper into whether the parrot has a potty mouth. Stay tuned. I know there's a, a a racial slur in this movie that I heard. I but I was there. I believe so. I didn't notice. Did, did I mishear that? Dan? No, you At didn't. The end of the film, yes, that's, that's <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> I was like, whoa, whoa, okay. <laughs> it's like, no, I'm just kidding. No, I'm being yeah, sarcastic. It was, it was there. Wasn't that nice? It that was... whole that whole karma happening. Yeah. Trying to give him a horseshoe. He goes there. Horseshoe pops his tire. <laughs> yeah, it was a it was a turn of events wasn't that, that a, basically makes you just look at the thing and go, well. Wasn't that a feel-good part yeah. of the movie? It, it just goes to show you don't have control. You don't no. have control. You, as no, much as control do. you think you have, you yeah. don't. In a lot of ways, it connects to the chaos theory stuff from Jurassic Park, right? Like the increased complexity just leads to further and further chances for failure. Ah, uh, uh, yes, that that that's chaos. <laughs> I kept thinking about, and you guys haven't seen this movie, but Troy, I'm sure has. Uh, Corbucci's The Specialists. Mm-hmm. The the ending for that, which I won't spoil for anyone who's uh, not seen it yet, but. That kind of fits in this conversation too, the the way that the main character finishes off that movie with a big old F off of his own, mm-hmm. although it's an Italian movie from the seventies, so he he says something different. But yeah. that may be my favorite well, Western. I love that movie. I think there's another 
I mean, if, if we're talking about films of this type and during this period and heist movies and whatnot, there's one that's not being mentioned that, that should be uh, is The Asphalt Jungle, uh, which Sterling Hayden had been in six years earlier for John Huston. Um, if you haven't seen it, um, if you didn't like this one, don't bother. But if you like this one, watch The Asphalt Jungle because that's a terrific film too. It's another heist film um, in the noir genre and uh, Sterling Hayden plays uh, another unlucky bastard in that one as well. Mm. Dix Handley. Dix Handley. Best character think, name in all of his movies. I think Dan did mention that movie at, earlier. Asphalt Jungle? Yeah, yeah I, I, I recognize the name. Yeah, it's I one, I, I bring it up every now and then just because Dix Handley. Okay. I mean, it's a hell of a movie and the conceits toward the third act are just out of this world good. Uh, but, yeah, we probably should watch you know that. Funny? I'm afraid you'll strangle that... me if I make you watch another old black and white movie. <laughs> I'm looking at the clown mask on the TV screen right now, and that's almost what Michael Myers' mask was going to be. Mm-hmm. You make a good that was, point. That was one of the masks that they cho- they that was in choice. That but was it going to be a full head one, or was it just going to be the face one, like when he's a kid? Uh, no, no, no. They well, it kind of looks like the one he wears when he kills his sister. But before they went with the Shatner mask, they were talking. What's the uh, the old? Uh, I, I believe it was like a clown hobo character from the twenties or something. Oh, okay. So that yeah, more of a full full, full heads kind of guy. Lives in the sewer. No, no not Pennywise. <laughs> uh, no, it's just like a clown face character that Don Post made a mask of, and he's apparently like a almost like a not a bozo the clown, but somebody who was used in advertising, whatever. So he was a known face. Gotcha. So that was one of the faces they picked too. So it would have looked a lot like that. I don't know if it would have been an overhead mask, mm. but it definitely looked like that. Well, and one of the funnier have, things brown. about that mask, and I don't know if it's more appropriate to talk about it now or if it's more appropriate to wait till we're actually talking about The Dark Knight. It, there's a direct line from this movie to The Dark Knight, but there's a stop in the middle. And I'm going to send you guys a, an image here from the old Batman TV show. Tell me if you've seen this mask before, guys. Oh, it's the Joker mask. Yes. I know. Did you just honk your horn? <laughs> Who did that? That was. I don't know. Oh, jeez. <laughs> it was a little creepy. It Somebody came up honked. When the picture came up. <laughs> but yeah, there's an episode in the 66 Batman where an unknown opera singer is mm-hmm. singing on TV and then he pulls the mask off and reveals the Joker makeup underneath, which is. A hundred percent the dark knight, right? Like I mean they just Oh yeah. The the thing about like we talked about I think last week when Travis wasn't here. When you are DC Comics, it's not stealing, it is utilizing your property. Property and they yeah. utilize the heck out of that scene in the Dark Knight and all the nerds like me who've seen that image since we were kids were just like, Oh my god. Mm-hmm. Sing us a song, Heath Ledger. <laughs> Whatever doesn't kill us makes us stranger. stranger. <laughs> it would have been great it, I mean it, a missed opportunity for Mr. Nolan what the heck dude it would have been cool if he sang because I know he can sing so it might have been interesting just splice in that scene layer. from uh, 10 things just CGI yeah. the makeup on him uh, Halloween H2O style I have such a big problem with uh, we'll, we'll talk about it when we get to the third movie Talk about wasted opportunities. Ah, oh, jeez. You you just sparked it when you talked about that movie. That's what I do, man. I spark you, you spark to it. get mad, and then we have a show. <laughs> That's the format. <laughs> Frequently, yeah. <laughs> Short little angry dude. When I say it, you'll be like, "Oh wow, yeah, that would have been uh, that would have been nice." Or you were like, "Nah, <laughs> nah," or I'd be like, "Nah." What's up with that theory? Yeah, no. It was actually <laughs> Catwoman the whole time, just having a dream. <laughs> yeah, every time. She was mentally unstable. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I was very angry about the fact that they, when they brought in Gordon Levitt to play in Rises, I saw that announcement, and I was the opposite of the announcement when Ledger was announced. Because I didn't really know he could do that. Mm. So I was like, Heath Ledger's the Joker? But then when they hired Levitt, I was like, oh, they're bringing him in to play the Joker. 
because he looks just like Heath Ledger. Mm. So I said, they're, oh, they're probably going to do like an Arkham scene or something where he can put that same appliances on and he'll look just like Heath Ledger. He's an amazing actor. He could have totally pulled it off and it would have been perfect. And then they make him... John rock. Blake. Yeah. Unknown, like, Ooh, just created yeah. for this movie. Don't look too closely at the man behind the curtain, John Blake. Right. No, I, I was fine with that. It just thought it was a missed opportunity to hire somebody that looks exactly like Heath Ledger and not cast him as, as I don't know how Joker. much looking like look Heath at, Ledger look matters. Well, no, but I mean, he would have been able, actor-wise, he would have been able to do the work yeah. to basically embody what yeah. I get it. I get it, but like when I when I watched Dark Knight, and we're talking way too much about Dark Knight right now, but the like the Heath Ledger Joker... I I don't see Heath Ledger at all. No, you don't. Like, at all. That's perfect. He does I'm not saying he should have played the Joker for the entire movie. I thought yeah, you're saying to, just a little To put, a little bookend thing. it, like, just kind of end that part, but give us the image of him in yeah. captivity. That's all. Yeah. Word. Wasted. They still could have done both. He could have played both characters. And You'd you have never known. Have known. Yeah. It would have been like uh, Jalo, directed by Argento, which we shall never discuss again. <laughs> Wait, we're not going to discuss a Jalo? <laughs> the movie called Jalo is oh, maybe the, the worst movie I've ever okay. seen with my eyes. <laughs> Troy, <laughs> Troy, can you convince me that Jalo is not bad? I think it's the worst movie I've ever seen. Well, I mean, I wouldn't say it's... I, I don't know how many movies you've seen. If that's the worst movie you've ever seen, you're very fortunate, but... Uh... I think his movie Dracula is even worse. Um, it's bad, but it's not. I don't think it's as bad as that. Really, I've seen worse Jally. I've seen worse Jally than that one. See, it's and I made Dracula it through Dracula just fine because I was like, "Oh, this movie sucks," but I'm like having fun with it. Jalo, it was like, "Oh, this movie's almost good, but it's so not good." Like, I think it was the, the feeling of like dissidence, right? Like the notes were so close together between good and terrible that I was just like, "I can't." My eyes, they... Uh. I felt that way a few times this season. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, word up. It's just, it's almost a song, but it's not. <laughs> almost. <laughs> <laughs> At the same time, when Jalo eventually gets a North American release, I'm going to buy it and watch it again, so... Yeah, you'll buy every version of it. I ever. already have the Spanish one, I think. The one that comes with a poster. <laughs> the 4K, the 5K, the 12K. But you know it, it what it's got I'll spend 12k. It on stars it. A, a real actor Adrian Brody in two roles, like the good guy and the bad guy. Oh. I mean cool. Adrian Brody, Oscar nominee or Oscar winner, like real good mm. actor. Yeah, I know that name. Miserable movie. Mm. Oh, how how old is it? Like the early 90s, mid 90s? Uh, no, no, no. 2000 2006. Okay, so it was Adrian Brody already established. Yeah, he was a git. Okay. No, two, I'm sorry. No, I think it's actually, now you're making me second guess. Myself. It may have been 2009, but it was after he'd won an Oscar already. And he was, right. yeah. Okay. So it was after King Kong then, because he did that in 2005. Yeah, 2009. Yes. I looked it up. Ooh. Wow. Yeah, so after The Dark Knight. <laughs> so you go see The Dark Knight in 08, and you're like, oh, what do I need next? I need Adrian Brody, Oscar winner, and a Jalo. This will be perfect. <laughs> So sad. Dracula 3D is terrible, but it's like fun. I don't know. But is it like is it like uh, Leslie Nielsen is Dracula bad or like Dracula dead and loving it? You know, if it weren't for the awful CGI, it's probably better than half of the Dracula movies ever made. Okay. Like if I think about some of the '70s ones that just go off the rails. Yeah. What about Once Bitten? <laughs> I mean, we're talking. It's that. close, man. Yeah. Wow. That's sad. But I'm very excited. Argento, his new movie comes out soon. Troy, are you as excited as I am? Well, I'm looking forward to it. I, his last three films have been bad. Um, I'm a big fan, but I, you know, it, it doesn't make you have to give up your fan club card to admit somebody made a bad movie. <laughs> um, although I think some people seem to think that way. Uh, it's the first movie he's made in a decade. That's the longest break he's ever had. It's the first film he shot, the first feature film he shot in Italian since the five days back in the 70s. Uh, that could be a good thing. 
And uh, it's a script he's wanted to make for many years and he's very excited about making it. That's another plus. And it's a young kind of crew that he hasn't worked with before. So yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I don't expect it to be deep red or tenebrae, but if it's, you know, if it's a good mid tier movie, I'll be happy with it. <laughs> Dan's sitting there going, wait, <laughs> lose your membership card. I had seven minutes to talk to John Carpenter and I called him out. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I would say I called him out. Uh, okay. What's all this about Carpenter? You're, you're, <laughs> you're confusing me at this point. So a while back, I did one of those Comic-Con type things where you get to do a video conference with a celebrity. And it's mostly like, yeah. hi, I'm Dan from Missouri and I'm a big fan, you know. And I think that's what he was expecting. Because then I was like, hey, so I asked him, you know, not a lot of people are watching umberto Lindsay movies in the 70s like are you seeing these at film school or wh where did you see these movies and he He's leans like, back in his chair in nostalgic made a, made a. nostalgic <laughs> like he, for a minute he uh, legit oh, abort, uh, abort. abort he said he leans back in his chair and he just kind of goes ah yeah and then he like realizes oh i just did that and he sits up and he goes oh i mean i saw those movies later i didn't see him at the time <laughs> and i was like i don't know john uh, carpenter so i might have just caught your, you your theory your theory is that uh, halloween's just a rip off of seven bloodstained orchids i would say my theory is borrowed that imagery in college he saw at least the first i would say probably just the first reel of seven bloodstained orchids and he was like oh that's a cool visual that's a cool visual that's a cool visual and so when it comes time to make the babysitter murders which becomes halloween and i don't know how much of this is carpenter and how much of this is the other guys but you know the book uh the behind I don't have it in front of me. The behind the mask or whatever they called it. The, the big Halloween behind the scenes book that came out a couple of years ago starts with the producer of Halloween on a plane back from an Italian film festival with this idea to do the babysitter murders. He's like 76. And so it's like, I, I mean, I have a YouTube video, Troy breaking down uh, just, you know, frame <laughs> comparisons like, Hey, look, these shots are the same. These shots are yeah. the same. Why are there dead pets? These shots are the same. Why is there a cut on her left arm right, right before she falls down the steps? The lady in the blue shirt <laughs> gets cut on the left arm from behind. Yeah. It's just right. like, okay, I mean, God, these are like the same Unbuttoned visual. Unbuttoned blouse and, like, and of the same color. It could have been interpretation, but Unbuttoned. right after Dan <laughs> completes his interrogation, you get the, I'm getting the, it's, it's time to go. <laughs> time to wrap it up. <laughs> time to wrap it up. It was legitimately time to go. He didn't hang up on <laughs> me. He was very nice. <laughs> I'm a huge oh, Carpenter fan, as you all know, but that is one thing that I, you know, there's a lot of coincidence there for, uh, you know, and he brought up Argento. He, you know, he kind of redirected mm -hmm. to, oh, yeah, I'm friends with Argento. I'm like, yeah, I can tell because Deep Red's all over Halloween. But <laughs> you, <laughs> you know, didn't say that. You were no, I didn't that. say that. Cause, yeah. And it's fine. You know, it, the thing is, right, Nolan, uh, we're going to find with the Dark Knight, borrows a lot of things from the zeitgeist. And my thing, the thing I keep hanging my, my hat on with this is, when Nolan does it, he's picking stuff that everybody saw in film school. He's picking movies from Criterion. He's picking movies that like are in the mainstream of film nerddom. So when he puts the heist from the killing in the first three minutes of his movie, he's not stealing it. He's like utilizing our culture, our cinema culture to make art. Right. But when you say you never saw the guy's movies and then you take a bunch of stuff from the guy's movies, it's kind of disingenuous. And we I, get... I really think you're way over exaggerating, quite frankly. I've, I've written books on both of these men. I know, and I checked uh, the indexes before I talked to you last time, I, just to see I, if you even broached the subject. I was like, does Troy get into this at all, or is this just my problem? It's just me. Yeah, it's my problem. problem. But we yeah, did. I, I, make... Honestly, I, I don't. No, I don't believe it. Um, I've, I mean, I know both films very well. I can definitely see some generic crossovers um but I, again this was not a movie that got a big distribution in the u.s back in the 70s um, well that's the it, problem right he's not it's fine he it saw that movie matter. later <laughs> it's fine but we did we did end that conversation with saying the good thing about carpenter is even if he's inspired by anything he made it better he perfected it he's well, I, mean, I, I think one of the it. things that i've always respected with him is he is honest about his influences and certainly mm -hmm. he's all go back to 1979 there was an interview in cine fantastique it was devoted to, an entire issue devoted to him 
and he does talk about bourbon with crystal plumage and he talks about four flies and gray velvet and you know, deep red big fan of those films he talks about deep red and argento on the commentary for halloween i, I don't mm -hmm. think he was ever trying to be slick about hiding that i just I don't know. I, I don't think we can assume that he saw a film that really didn't get much of a distribution in the U.S. Um, and that is now readily available. But at that time, that wasn't necessarily the case. It did get some play here, but I don't know that we can assume that, uh, that he necessarily saw it at the time. Maybe he did. I'm well, that's why that. we asked him. Right? Well, and that's why the question was, <laughs> where are you seeing this movie in 1976 or whatever? <laughs> so, Troy, you know. Troy, question. Yes. Uh, the movie Halloween, um, the two kids that are at the, the final kids, what are their names again? <sighs> Tommy and Lindsay. Lindsay. <laughs> <laughs> Lindsay. Really? Lindsay. Did you come up with that name. And he says it a bunch of times there. I, I just thought that was ironic. I, I don't believe any of this. <laughs> I, when Dan was bringing all this stuff up, I was literally, my ears were turning red. Cause I'm like, this is my favorite movie. Do not, do not, do not. <laughs> And he did. I did. And he, will... and he showed me screenshots. <laughs> Travis will believe this when Dan believes the Wendy theory. Yeah. Yeah. The Wendy theory is way more legit than, than this, but it's fine. Hey, Carpenter said no. I'm going with no. So, Troy, it's 1976. <laughs> uh, the producer of Halloween is coming back on an airplane from an Italian Still movie. On it. <laughs> Let me just, uh, Troy. Just... Well, you are aware that there are other things made in Italy besides thrillers, I hope. <laughs> oh, I am aware. So here's what here's what I'm going to tell you. He's coming back from a movie, 1976. You've seen the tough ones, I assume, uh, probably more more times than I have. <laughs> Play that music. The tough ones music is the Halloween music. I mean, it's the same. Maybe it's the same. Saw lots of movies when he was in <laughs> Italy in 1976. Cool. He was. Hey. The producer was. Producer was. Oh, yeah. whatever. <laughs> I just. It's a little <laughs> weird. It's a little hey. weird, right? Uh, <laughs> give me the keys. Uh, uh, <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> yeah, I don't. I've never noticed a similarity. Do 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 do. Which song was I just humming? You don't. You know what also sounds like the Halloween theme? Jaws. Oh. Do you know what else sounds like Halloween? Deep Red and tubular bells. And the tubular bells, exactly. Yep. So I think it's far more likely that they're taking from the tubular bells. Yeah, we we've discussed the music in this enormously popular and successful film in 1973. And also, by his own admission, the music from Deep Red. Yeah, I mean, that's. I'm glad that you agree with that, because at least that we finally, you said something, because on the show, we've talked about the evolution of that non-Herman horror theme, which was basically Tubular Bells, Deep Red, then Halloween. And without those first two, you don't get a Halloween theme. Yeah. So, yeah, okay. Oh, absolutely. You did say that. I'm not a totally yeah. insane person, but if you go back and listen to the Tough Ones music, it well, sounds a lot like that. Halloween. Thing and like that, I can hear it now that you mention it that way. I never noticed it myself before. Um, yeah. I mean, that's that's a battle for Franco Michelizzi to fight because he's the one who wrote the music. <laughs> so, yeah, fair enough. I don't know. I is that you know is that something that was on the radar at that time? It was playing it's in theaters in the U.S. Um, in 1976 and then late 80s, you know, late 70s rather. It was re-released under a couple of different titles. Who knows? I mean, I, I couldn't say for sure, but yeah, I mean, the the Lindsay connection, I'm sure Lindsay would be very flattered, I'll put it that way, and I'm sure Lindsay likes, would have liked to have thought that he influenced everything that was ever made. Uh, <laughs> I kind of get the impression but, that, yeah, maybe. <laughs> he seems yeah, like a, a cool bit. dude. <laughs> I, I no, like no, him a was, lot. You know, he was an interesting character, there's no question. Very talented. Made a lot of good films, made some not so good films, but, you know, most people don't you know very few people have sort of spotless records but yeah i don't know i mean that's it's an interesting proposition i i would stop short of calling it any kind of plagiarism i don't think that's necessarily fair but um and i didn't say the p word you know because i'm trying yeah, to avoid the l by. word <laughs> so we, we just said inspired by a few times uh, yes which, indeed which well, as an artist it happens all the time it's a theory it is a theory <laughs> We love theories. Theories are good. I mean, it's a lady in a kitchen. 
<laughs> with a <laughs> pet. That's never <laughs> happened in a motion picture before. I know. It was followed shortly by getting mostly naked in the kitchen. Did you notice that there's also similarities? They're both in widescreen. They're both in color, and they were both shot on 35 millimeter. Oh my wow. goodness! I mean, holy it, shit! It's a rip off. Jeez Louise. <laughs> You know, the actors, did you notice that they have actors who recite dialogue and wear costume? Oh, it's, oh it's just, gosh, it's, it's a like scandal. It's the same movie. It's a <laughs> scandal. We're, we're, we're cracking there, it open. There is a seven-hour drive, pot pot drive, in the Lindsay movie that got <laughs> edited out. <laughs> <laughs> edited out yeah. There actually is a lot of driving in the Lindsay time. movie, which is a problem. Uh, that Lindsay <laughs> movie, the first act is great. And here's the thing. If I was a director who was going to borrow some imagery from that movie, I also would have skipped the last three quarters of that movie because it gets really boring real fast. Oh, I like it. I mm. think it's fun. Um, I think it's an enjoyable one. I mean, it's not necessarily one of the best Jowie. That's the thing, too. There were so many of those movies being cranked out in the 70s, and very few of them got over here uh, in any kind of meaningful way. And that's the difficulty because people do this thing all the time. It's like with um, Brian De Palma. Mm -hmm. Everybody goes apeshit over the fact that in, in Raising Cain, um, there's a scene where John Lithgow you know, bends down and somebody's standing right behind him. Oh, the, the Tenebrae. Everybody's, everybody's, that's from Tenebrae. Well, you know, I mean, De Palma has been interviewed specifically about the whole Argento thing. They've asked him this, and he said, Look, back in the 70s, Scorsese showed me a couple of these movies. They didn't really make much of an impression on me. I do remember Bird of the Crystal Plumage. Okay. Bird of the Crystal Plumage does have a scene where Tony Misante bends down. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you can see somebody standing behind him. So that's fair enough. But what strikes me about that film, or about Tenebrae in general, is it feels to me almost like Argento is trying to make a De Palma movie. Uh, no, we haven't watched sexier. Tenebrae yet, so no spoilers, because that's one I'm going to feature no spoilers, with George. No spoilers, but it's a, it's a much sexier film. It's much more like a De Palma movie to me than it is, you know, typical. So I guess my whole thing is usually because we love these kind of offbeat movies that don't get a lot of attention, a lot of fans tend to be nuts about saying, oh, this was stolen from here and this was stolen mm -hmm. from there. And it's not really always the case. Sometimes it really is coincidental. And, uh, you know, I, I think it's fun to kind of theorize about it. I don't think there's any harm in it, but I do think sometimes it's, it's easy to get a little carried away with that. That's, that's kind of where I'm at now um, versus maybe back in my twenties, I might've been a little bit more to be like, Oh, everybody's just ripping off this, this movie. Eh, I mean, it could be, it could also just be, Sometimes people have really cool ideas kind of independently from one another, too. So it, it's hard to say. Plus, we're in kind of a, an era of with the YouTube and everybody's doing their YouTube shows and they're doing Easter eggs and this and that. And they're always pointing out, and this is from this and this is from that. Mm -hmm. And nine times out of ten, the guy never even saw that influence. He just kind yeah. of, yeah, no, I know what you're saying. That's the funny part. I mean, it's it's and I think a lot of things are subconscious. I do believe that, but I, I also think there is a tendency sometimes to think, you know, especially when you're thinking about a little low budget movie that is shot real super quick. I don't know that they have time <laughs> to always sit there and think, I want to recreate this because this impressed me in this little movie that nobody ever saw. And I want to take this. And, and I don't know that that's always a possibility or if that's really even practical in terms of making a movie. Um, maybe, yeah, you, you see something at a drive-in or something and you think, well, it's a cool scene and maybe it's subconsciously in the back of your mind, you kind of recreate it. But to me, there's a big difference between that sort of thing happening, which can happen and does happen, versus somebody kind of looking at an obscure film and saying, I really like this movie. I don't think anybody's familiar with this. I'm going to rip the hell off of it. <laughs> I think it they call that the, uh, the Friday the 13th Part 2 is what they call <laughs> <laughs> well, you what. that's that's a whole separate discussion too. Yeah, there, there's a lot of theories about about that versus uh, Mario Bava. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's hard to say. It's I I kind of get a little hesitant sometimes about wanting to draw too strong of a case about it. It's just like, well, it's kind of cool that there are coincidences and there are certain things that kind of echo. I you know, but beyond that, it's it, I don't know. Like I said, to me, it's very difficult unless you have somebody connected with the film saying, oh, yeah, we were we were influenced by this or we saw that or whatever, which which does happen. 
Um, otherwise, you're getting into theorizing, and it's it's just tricky to say for sure whether something really did or did not have an influence. That's all. So what you're saying is, if you don't just give the person making the movie the benefit of the doubt, you could just become obsessive. A little bit. <laughs> Try to find it and everything. Does it sound like <laughs> someone we know, Travis? I don't know. All I know, I, I know I've done it. Like I've directed <laughs> plays and I've I've oh, done I've... things where I've borrowed from other inspiration. Oh, things. I thought you meant become obsessive. Because uh, I've I've, as well. I've I've become obsessive, not about movies, about right. guitar pedals, but and the parts that they use. Yeah. I mean before there was even the internet, when I was in I think middle school, my art teachers used to tell us to go buy a, a, a bunch of manila folders. And then go through the newspapers and magazines and cut out artwork or photographs or whatever that might inspire you. You know, make folders in, in your filing cabinet, you know, uh, different layouts that you might like or different, you know, paintings or this. Like, yeah, so you got to get back then. You got to get inspired you by something. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, if I were a filmmaker, then, yeah, I would definitely uh do a scrapbook of of techniques and be like, oh yeah, that looks great. If I ever make this movie, I'm going to use that technique. Like, I, I yeah. can totally see that. Sure. Well, and the unique thing about film, you know, we're only now at like the hundred year mark for mainstream commercial film. So you've got a very limited history of what people, and it, it's not very. It wasn't democratized until recently. So you have a very small pool of visual techniques uh going back to the beginning of film where going back to the beginning of music there's no way that you could just you know catalog all of it because it's been going back too far same with uh you know painting uh you wouldn't be able to catalog all of human history of painting but you could legitimately you know as a company catalog every human film uh in a much more reasonable time so what you've got is like a smaller pool to draw from so I think, I mean, you know, everybody ends up with a shorthand uh, and a lot of it is going to be influenced by what you've seen in the past. Uh, and there's also a fallacy where, you know, I may at first think, okay, these two guys are ripping each other off when really they're both ripping off Hitchcock who did something similar 10 years before either right. of them. So there's always that, mm. you know, shared evolutionary relative that you, if you didn't take note of that, you might think that, you know, Lindsay's ripping off Bava, who then Carpenter rips off Lindsay, but in fact they're all just doing dial M for murder with the phone kill in different ways. Word. Well, nothing's created in a vacuum either, and there's all kinds of different influences that come into it. I mean, some filmmakers are more inspired really by um, literature. Um, some are more inspired by painting and, and different things like that. So, you know, uh, there's a new generation of filmmakers that are very film savvy. And I guess that really started probably like the, the sort of 70s generation, you know, the directors like uh, Lucas and Coppola and Scorsese and so forth, De Palma, who were coming out from being, you know, really obsessive about movies. Whereas a lot of the people who came before them really didn't give a shit about movies. Yeah. They weren't really big film buffs. They were just doing what they were doing. I mean, Hitchcock wasn't really somebody who sat down and watched a ton of movies. Um, he, he said it really wasn't something that he tended to do. He didn't really tend to pay much attention because he didn't really want to fall into that trap of kind of trying to copy what other people were doing. And really some of the worst films that he did were things where he was being encouraged to follow certain trends. Mm. So like in the late sixties with a couple of spy films that he did, for example, because the bond movies were really big, that wasn't his thing. And th those movies weren't really all that good. Well, in Frenzy, um, I mean, well, Frenzy, you know, that's very much, you could argue to an extent that's kind of his response to the Jallo in a way, but also to the more sort of frank material that was coming out even in Hollywood movies like Flute, for example, um, which were sort of modern thrillers. Um, it's an old man's film in a sense that it's it's set in an England that didn't even exist at that time, which um you know it it's it's kind of curiously out of date it feels like it's set in the 40s even though it's set in the 70s because hitchcock's points of reference were more the 40s really uh he didn't you know 
Hitchcock wasn't really interested in youth culture. So it kind of exists in this weird never never land that doesn't really exist and didn't exist in 1972. Um, although I, I do think, I mean, to your point earlier, I do think he does manage to stage a memorably nasty and, and very vicious murder in it that I think has a real impact to it. But is it bloody and gory and does it go to the, you know, the nth degree? No. Um, I don't think he really had that in him, but I mean, think of like the shower murder in Psycho, for example, it terrified everybody in 1960. Nowadays, everybody, you know, I, I don't know if that would really scare people now or not. I'm not really sure. But at the time, it was certainly terrifying. Um, but, you know, he was more about sort of suggesting and uh, alluding to the violence as opposed to getting into a kind of a bloodbath type of situation. I just think it was a it was a different kind of approach compared to what some of the younger guys were doing, which was basically saying, well, we can get away with doing all this stuff. So we're just going to have entrails all over the place and it's going to be really gory and blah, blah, blah. I don't, I just don't know that that was really his taste. There's that one shot though. Uh, Frenzy. I like the movie. It's just, I felt like one scene in particular, just kind of, it felt like nobody knew what they were doing on set. And as far as direction goes, and it just kind of fell apart. But there's a scene in that movie that is just, basically just camera movement for a good minute. That is the scariest scene in the movie. And maybe the scariest scene I've seen from Hitchcock since I don't know, the mid sixties. I'm trying to think of something between psycho and that, that was as frightening as just camera movement in frenzy where it's just like this guy, this is him at the top of his game. Holy moly. Good to see. Good to see that kind of production at the end of one's career. You know, we were talking about shock recently, the Bava, and how it doesn't feel like the last movie this guy would have made. He was still producing like top quality stuff. Oh no, he was, I mean, he, he died, uh, unfortunately, rather suddenly had a heart attack. Um, funnily enough, um, he'd had a, uh, medical exam not long before cause he was supposed to make another film and he was, you know, they, they said he was fine for insurance purposes. He was totally you know, okay, but all of a sudden had a heart attack. I mean, he had worked, he was a workaholic, um, and he looked much older than his age. He was a chain smoker. Um, but no, he still had movies in him. It was unfortunate that he died when he died. Um, you know, but that's, unfortunately, that's the way it goes. Sometimes he dies at the age of 65, whereas, uh, uh, well, we still have Orgeno, for example, you know, making films into his eighties. So you just never know. Look at Clint Eastwood. I mean, he's like 173 yeah. years old. <laughs> he's what, yeah. Well, there you go. I mean, he's still directing yeah. Oscar award-winning movies. It's crazy. You know, this is a guy who's taking care of himself. I mean, on yeah. a certain level, if you're if you you know take care of yourself and don't have the bad habits like smoking and drinking and and everything else, you know, that's that's going to help you in the long run, I guess. But I mean, not look at Tom Brady. Kind of Tom Brady. Yeah. 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 I try never to look at Tom Brady. Keith Richards. Unless he's in my rear view mirror after he gets eliminated, then I look at Tom Brady. Keith Richards died 10 years ago and no one told him. <laughs> he's still figuring it out. I think he's probably mummified by whatever he, he did in the 70s. <laughs> you know, they find like that that person in the bogs where their the oils of their body have become like soap. <laughs> that, that's him. Yeah. <laughs> Now, we've gone a little bit off topic, but I think we've stayed in the ballpark because in the end, what we're going to do uh, by the time we get to the Dark Knight is we're going to Halloween it, and I'm going to show you what it's ripping off and it's going to break your heart, Travis. I'll, I'll be fine with it. I, yeah. I, I think I've been I've been put over your knee a few times <laughs> enough that I... <laughs> well, you already I'm said that, it. that Nolan doesn't rip off. That's the true. Only. This might be the, I don't know if it, you will have to see, we'll have to cross that bridge when we come to it. But believe me, when you see the Italian influence uh, on the dark night, you are going to lose your mind and I'm going to break the internet. So get ready. Mm -hmm. Very good. It's, all, it, it's the weird thing about influence too, because, you know, very often um, directors like Nolan and, and others, you know, they're making films for uh, a modern audience and they're, they're doing things, you know, that are, very contemporary or whatever, um, even if they're honest about what they're taking things from, a lot of younger people aren't going to want to go back and watch older movies mm -hmm. like this. I mean, it, it's unfortunate to me 
that there's a lot of people who would watch a movie like this derisively, that they would laugh at it and think that it's hokey and it's old and it's a black and white, black and white sucks. I, I mean, I grew up, you know, in the eighties watching old movies on TV and I never mm -hmm. saw them as hokey. I never saw them as uh, dated uh, in that way. I've always understood that, you know, films are made, they reflect the periods in which they're made. Um, so Nolan is, yeah, he's referencing something like the, uh, the killing, for example, but I wonder if a lot of people who really love that film would take to a movie like this. I'm not sure. Right. Well, I'd well, say remember... from our experiment tonight that probably not given <laughs> at least George's reaction to the killing. Maybe not. Wait, what? He I, said he liked it. I liked it. Yeah. yeah. I told you last night I didn't like it, but I was nowhere near finished. I was just like, what? Why am I watching? Why no, are we watching this? That's what I, I, I sent him a text. You're right. I was like, why are we watching this? Because it's like Ocean's Eleven, uh, Ocean Ocean's Eleven's uglier cousin <laughs> or something. <laughs> I can't remember what I said. No. And then you're like, just save it for the pod. <laughs> when I when I was watching it, I I was I was thinking, wow, this is, this really must have blown minds back in 1956 because of all the, the right the and because I and yeah I because I had. You know, it's it's well, you're a old Tarantino news. Boy. Exactly, it's yeah. old news to me. But yeah. like, I'm like, whoa, this is '56. Is probably the first time that was a happy accident. This was we done. weren't we weren't making a reference to Tarantino until I realized when I finished this movie, I was like, oh wow, he's gonna like it because it's very, very uh, Pulp Fiction-ish. Mm -hmm. So, yep. boom. So you're let's welcome. tell. But yeah, George, I didn't, I didn't uh, think it was terrible. I thought it was good. I mean, it, it's dude, it's a movie from freaking. Right. What? I, what is it? Like eighty years ago at this point? Fifty. Seventy years ago? Like, yeah, it's it's good. But to to it's go good. back to what Troy was talking about, I I remember watching the Peter Jackson King Kong remake in the theater, mm -hmm. and I'm sitting there and I'm watching. <laughs> that movie was made for me. <laughs> that like, is a masterpiece. That, that, that movie, movie. He was he was speaking my language. Yeah. So I'm sitting there and I'm watching that movie, and that movie is chock full of everything that Troy just talked about, because it's like the the t-rex scene or the v-rex fight scene is put in there for the the modern audience he's fighting three v-rexes there it's ridiculous it's off the chain but then when he gets ground level he has a frame by frame reenactment fight from oh, the 33 mm. kong every from the punch to the jaw to the beating of the chest it was just a frame by frame homage to O'Brien. And then when they get to the city and he's chained up on the stage, I'm like, all right, what are they going to do here? There's the orchestra playing the old score from the mm. Cooper movie. I'm like, oh, yeah. And all the costumes are from the 33 movie. And they're basically saying, yeah, this really happened. And the 33 movie was a dramatization of what happened. And I'm just watching it with a shit eating grin, like, oh my God, if I were ever. <laughs> given millions of dollars to make a movie it would have been this it would have been this yeah and then they danced in the park and i was like fuck <laughs> <laughs> can't win them all man but then, but then when that went away i was fine again but that was just the one thing that took me out of that movie it was it was a it was a a celebration i was just watching i was like this is exactly what what people are supposed to do when they homage a classic yeah the well, opposite we... of what they did with the psycho remake Oh yeah, Oof. which and I even, haven't watched and won't. No, don't watch it. Even when you you know talking about like audience sensibilities and so forth for the time. I mean, to bring it back to Halloween again. You know, I mean, compare that film in 1978, how it played in 78, and I don't know how it would play now. I don't know if people would still really find it as effective as they did then or not. Um, whereas the direction it had to go in the 80s, because all of a sudden it's getting more into gory uh, slasher type fare. And so the second one is that much more amped up and it's that much more gory. Take it all the way to last year when they put out Halloween kills, um, which is just this, again, kind of bloodbath kind of an approach, which is very far removed from what the original film was, but you know, in a way you have to kind of adapt to the tastes of the audience. So it, that always factors into it as well. Hmm. And that was a divisive one. We aren't going to talk about that yet because this fall we're going to have George watch 2018 Kills and then Ends for like a, a little trilogy. So uh, we're going to have to save that for October. Sorry, George. But uh, 
I'm looking forward to that discussion. I think yeah, I can't wait to see. What it's gonna get bloody with, with Travis between Travis so and I. Out. Yeah. We might have some bloodshed. Travis is so pissed yeah. about that movie. I don't know why. <laughs> I, I'm, not sure I, will. I'm sure I agree with you, Travis. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you, Troy, for joining us. It's always a pleasure to have you on the show, man. Uh, we can't wait. Uh, tell us a little bit about your upcoming Umberto Lindsay book. Well, I mean, it's uh, coming out through WK Books. Hopefully it'll be out in the spring. Um, again, kind of looking at the entirety of his career, uh, going all the way back to the very beginning and talking about all the different types of films that he made. Uh, he's somebody that for years I didn't really rate him as much as all that. I was a little bit dismissive of him for a variety of reasons, but I've become obviously much more fond of him as time has gone on and I'm a big fan of a lot of his films especially his police films from the 70s which are really terrific uh, he made some good Gialli and uh, unfortunately he's better known in the U.S. for things like Cannibal Ferox which I don't think is really you know indicative of what he was truly capable of so he's a good example of the kind of Italian working director during that period of time who just you know whatever was in fashion he was making them uh, adapting to whatever was popular at a given time and, and cranking out a lot of movies. So the man made a lot of movies. Uh, a lot of them are quite good. Some of them are quite bad, but they, uh, they are all part of a very interesting filmography. And this is the first book written in English devoted to his films. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to see how people will enjoy it. Well, thank you so much, Troy. Travis, do you think well, we ought to tell, uh, tell George what we're watching next week? The one we've been trying to watch. The one we keep trying to watch, but you got sick <laughs> yeah. and then we couldn't. Yeah. Yeah. I think we're going to watch a movie that was inspired by The Killing. Okay. And also inspired many events in The Dark Knight as well. Is it so. called Chill? It's. No, it's not a source. Chill. <laughs> no. uh, it's Heat. Ah. We're going to finally watch Heat. The opposite. The opposite. Heat. Heat. And if we don't watch Heat, maybe been, we'll watch hey, True Lies. We've been threatening to watch this movie for like a month now. Yeah, but it's think of good. the things that you did watch. I, I listened to your uh, your Batman uh, episode with the cartoons. Yeah, the animated. It's and, good stuff. And I was I was playing along. I was saying things and realizing I'm not part of the show. <laughs> but, well, that teaches yeah. you to get sick. You can't do that anymore. I know. I know. I can't do that anymore. Well, I, th I think I'm good. I don't think I'll. I don't think it'll happen again. <laughs> <laughs> who the hell knows I got all three so we're good I hope thank you so much Troy uh, anytime you want to do podcasts let us know we like to have you on absolutely well, well thank you for having me it's always fun and uh, yeah I hope you enjoy talking about Heat that's a great film too now go listen to the tough ones real quick and tell me how you feel <laughs> yeah. the other thing I keep telling the guys and it drives them crazy and I think our audience likes it is that the way that you write a John Carpenter theme song is you just say the name of the movie on a keyboard. Oh, God. So, Halloween, <laughs> Halloween, cool. Halloween, Halloween. Uh, the, well, that's thing. The, uh, well, the thing. Jaws. The thing. He didn't do the thing, but yeah, the, the music anyway. But that's what James <laughs> Bernard did. Uh, the composer did a lot of the Hammer movies. And, uh, Carpenter's a big fan, so that makes sense. Hold mm. on, hold on, hold on. Guys, did Troy just agree with my insane theory think... about... <laughs> you got him with one of them. Yeah. Did you just agree with my insane yeah. theory? You didn't sing well, the Jaws work, theme. It doesn't, it doesn't work across the board, but it does right. work on a couple of them. That Bat is amazing, man, guys. Batman. Yeah. Batman. <laughs> Bat Superman. Man, Batman. I mean, all the Batman movies do it. <laughs> Superman does it. Wow. Yeah, that's that's also not as good as the Wendy theory, but we'll go with it. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it, you know, it's based on concrete fact, not conjecture. So right, right. it just can't be as fun as the Windy Theory. Word. All right. Well, Troy, I'll send you a bunch of screen caps from the two movies side by side so you can see my points. And I can see the cracks gonna... the cracks forming in your armor. It's happening. Are we going to get a, tro a Troy in post? <laughs> we might get a Troy in post. <laughs> Never know. Look at the look at these photos and then send us an audio of you arguing with with Ben. I, I think that'd be a fantastic side Troy episode. Post. That'd be great. I'm calling it. There you go. Thank you for joining us on the Remedial Film Class podcast. As always, you can find us at facebook.com slash remedial film pod and on Twitter and Instagram at remedial film pod. We'll be back next week with Michael Mann's classic Heat. 
I think Meg sent a uh, sent something. Uh, it said she sent an attachment, but I didn't actually get an attachment. Yeah, I couldn't open it either. <laughs> Is that a parrot? Oh, it's saying... a yeah, it's a bird. <laughs> what the fuck? Here it is. <laughs> is that your bird? I'm going to find that no, clip it's... for you guys real quick. Because I'm telling you, he says something. It, it would not have passed the sensors. And that's why I was just like, that's really weird. You know what I thought when I saw the date of this movie? Wow, Kubrick is older than I thought. Mm. I'm back here about well, that's that. why he died during Eyes Wide Shut. Yeah. Go, yeah. Okay, here well, we are. Probably, Here's the bird. I'm making that movie because of the people that were in it. <laughs> yeah, okay. Oh, he's so playing, he's playing he audio walks in. Can you hear this? Is this coming through? Yeah. How'd it go, dear? Not, not really. I just put my head to the microphone. <laughs> it sounds like he says, oh, F, watch it there. When the guy comes in and shakes the cage. But here, you guys be quiet for a second. Let me hear it again and see if I'm crazy. Because I was watching this today in a rush. Dear. Yeah, he says, oh, F, watch it there, is what it sounds like to me. So if you want to do this, it's at the hour and 16 minute and like 35 second mark. George film. George Back walks in and bumps into the... Uh, it's a Bruder film. <laughs> bumps into the birdcage there and, and it goes actually said to, hour, to the right. Hour and 16? Hour 16 and then play it All from right. there. All right. Okay, here we go. You ready? Volume up. I have those same locks on my uh, my Anderson case. I hate them. Hmm. Not well. <laughs> oh fuck! I told oh, you. Fuck. I'm not crazy. I might be crazy, but I'm also not wrong in this particular instance. They got it past the sensors. They got it past the sensors, but he definitely <laughs> says the F word. So, okay. Oh, fuck. Watch it there. See, Watch out. That's Watch out. not what a bird would say. Okay. Well, I feel good. Also, it's like an Amazon parrot in like a parakeet cage. Yeah. Yeah, he's not spreading his wings in that thing. <laughs> Watch it there. Watch out. Watch out. <laughs> Definitely says so fuck. He definitely does. Oh, uh, that's hilarious. <laughs> oh, fuck. <laughs> Oh, fuck. Oh, fuck. Watch it. Watch Dude, it. Dude, save that. Save that audio and drop it. Oh, man. <laughs> so good. Well, guys, uh, I'm excited to talk about Heat with you. It, it also influenced The Dark Knight. And then after that, we might have to get a little wild and talk about Italian influences. Are you guys excited? I don't know. Italian influences of what? The Dark Knight? Yeah, Italian influences upon The Dark Knight. Sure. Oh, it's going to be not. tight. You're going to have to watch a movie, though, and it's old. I'm sorry. It's fine. <sighs> so good. <laughs>